pleasure for me to talk to 150 participants from uh, all invisible to me. So it is a bit uh, challenging as well, but uh, I know very a few personally who will be watching me. So let's say I deliver for them. So it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to start this uh, presentation, this symposium. And I'm very grateful to Sergei. I certainly don't deserve this uh, role, but uh, I'm going to try very sincerely to keep you challenged and entertained. So my uh, presentation today is uh, about photo, uh, uh, photo modification of polymers, not really about thermal responsive. But uh, as mentioned uh, by uh, Sergey in the introduction, I've always been quite interesting in, interested in uh, responsive polymers. So, uh, and I know that during this, pre this symposium, there'll be many talk on uh, responsive materials. We can talk about uh, temperature responsive polymer, like uh, polynipam, which has a a uh, cloud point when you heat its solution in water. Many of uh, us will probably talk about the pH sensitive, which are an important class of polymers for the drug delivery, where, for example, in the stomach, you meet a very acidic pH. Magnetic, also in the medical science, electric, enzymatic, and light. And why did I, I mean, I show you here a, a photo mobile, we'll come to this later on. Why did I choose light? I think I always had a bit of a soft spot for light, and especially light and its interactions with matter. So uh, when it came to do my PhD, I had no hesitation, and I went to study uh, photo, uh, organic photochemistry, and I learned from a very good master, uh, all the keys of uh, photochemistry, photophysics. And I carried this in my life immediately. For a postdoc, I went to work with a famous uh, polymer chemist, also photochemist in Japan. So I was really very interested. Why light? It is a, clo a very clean tool, and it can actually uh, go very precisely through time and the location. It's directional. You can target precisely where it will be. You can control the energy or the wavelength. You, uh, it's site-specific. And uh, quick on, off, for if you want to want fast response. So all together, light is what we're going to talk about. More specifically, most of my talk will be con uh, concerned with uh, azo dyes and uh, their role as uh, in a reversible trans to cis photoisomerization. So the azo dye is shown uh, here in a very general uh, structure. It was synthesized at the, the turn of the century, probably uh, Staudinger uh, was uh, well aware of it, uh, and uh, used uh, in the German textile industry because of the brilliant co colors that it had. So um, this dye, excuse me, later on, it was observed that when you irradiate it with UV light, it undergo a, a, an isomerization for the more stable trans state to the less stable cis state. So if you want to go back to the trans, you irradiate the cis stable state with a visible light. So UV light you get to the cis and visible light you go back to the trans. So it's very fa uh, easy to control. And uh, sorry, it's moving a bit fast here, yeah, excuse me. And uh, by doing the cis to trans isomerization, you change the UV visible spectrum, I'll go back to this, 
but you also change the, the geometry of the molecule. It changes configuration. You change dipole moment. So there are many other liquid crystalline uh, properties. So many other properties of the dye change during the isomerization. So the, the key question there that uh, scientists uh, investigated well, is it possible to convert this uh, molecular change in the geometry of the molecule into a, molec a macroscopically change of a material? So can you observe the cis-trans uh, isomerization in either by a change of shape of a, of a solid of, on an object or by some other property? So I'll give you some simple example first because uh, you are polymer chemist and uh, you know a lot about, or possibly about uh, polynipam and, and it's, uh, oops, 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 oops. Mm -hmm. The polynipam, which is a thermosensitive polymer that has a cloud point in water, at around 30 degrees. So we, uh, the first report on this uh, ESO-derived uh, polynipam was done by uh, Tamaoki uh, in 2007. He observed, he prepared a semi telecalic ESO polynipam and um, he, he put, put at one end of this polymer an ESO group which is uh, linked directly to the polynipam, and uh, it undergoes a uh, trans to cyst isomerization. And it turns out that in this specific isomer of azo, the dipole moment of the cis isomer is uh, smaller than that of the trans. So in a really rough language, we could say that the cis form is more hydrophobic. I hate this, but I mean, it's, people often say this. So it would mean that the polymer become as a whole more hydrophobic. So the cloud point should actually increase upon irradiation. And you can see that before irradiation, the arrow shows the cloud point and around the 32. And after irradiation, it shifts up by uh, two to four degrees. It's small, you can actually play your game better and have a larger shift, but it's purely related to this change in the dipole moment. So if you irradiate now with visible light, you go back to where you are. So you go back to the original cloud point almost you can see that there is a degree or so that uh, isn't quite there. And this is a matter of time and hysteresis. Finally, we get back to where we are. So this was a very simple example. Here is another one. This is the case of a um, telecalic polymer. It's a, a polymer that has um, is used a lot in various industrial applications as a viscosity enhancer uh, in uh, coating fluids, in shampoos, in many places. And from the molecular viewpoint, this polymer forms as two hydrophobic group and a hydrophilic chain so it forms what's called flower micelles with all the uh, hydrophobic groups clustered together. And the, the chain, the polymer chain forms the petals around the flower. And when the concentration increases, the uh, micelles start to bind to each other. So one chain escapes and goes into the next micelles, etc. And that creates an increase in the viscosity. So the question is, what happens if we have a viscous solution of this polymer and irradiate it with uh, UV light to trigger the trans to cis isomerization? Well, you can see in a matter of a few minutes 
as you irradiated with UV light, the viscosity drops a lot. And this is because the links between the, the gel really that forms change because of the change in the geometry of the isogroup and the viscosity decreases. Then you radiate with visible light and uh, you get back to where you are. So this is a way to control the viscosity of a fluid through UV light. We also did some work by preparing thermo, photo, pH sensitive nanogels. We had uh, prepared a polynipalm nanogel, which by the uh, cross-linking of this uh, uh, polymer chain I show you, it's a polynipalm, a few uh, acrylate groups at the end of the chain and uh, linked to it is a uh, iso group which is actually very hydrophobic so in order to make the the reaction the, the polymerization and the stable nanogel we trapped it in cyclodextrin alpha cyclodextrin where, where the, is the trans iso group actually fits very tightly. So we could, uh, for example, when we heat the, uh, the nanogel, the polynipalm core of the nanogel will uh, decrease because it will be above the cloud point of polynipalm, it becomes very hydrophobic. But since we have the cyclodextrin and trapping the azo group on the surface of the nanogel, the nanogel remains stable. So you do actually, uh, you heat above the cloud point, but your suspension remains very stable. And by cooling, you go back. You just see the, diff the change in the size, shown here by the change in the hydrodynamic radius. On the other hand, if you, uh, you know, irradiate the nanogels at room temperature, you actually trigger the trans to cis isomerization. And somehow the cis isomer does not fit in a cyclodextrin anymore, in the alpha cyclodextrin. So the cyclodextrin is expulsed. The, the nanogel becomes very hydrophobic and as aggregates. But if you irradiate with visible light, we are back to square one. So again, a, a change we can have. And here I just show you that indeed the, uh, the photoisomerization of isobenzene takes place. And you can uh, monitor it very precisely through the change of the UV spectrum absorption spectrum of the azo group as a function of irradiation. So if you irradiate at 365, causing the, cis, the trans to cis isomerization, you see, a, you see a gradual, quite fast actually after a minute, decrease of this band here, which is due to the uh, trans cyclodextrin. And uh, you see an, an increase of this uh, group uh, band here, quite small, which is due to the cis isomer. And as you increase, you irradiate with a visible light, you, you increase again, you, and the, you go for, this band decreases, this one increases, so you are back to where you were. So it turns out that uh, UV, UV absorption spectroscopy is quite a convenient means to, to figure out what's happening in your suspension or solution. Having said that, I come back to the more general part, uh, which is uh, what can be done to change the uh, absorption spectrum of azo compounds from the UV, where I showed you for the very plain uh, azobenzene with no substituent, to, towards the visible and possible even the IR. And what is the effect of this introduction of substituent 
on the general photo isomerization process. So the first step is, uh, this is, so isobenzene, I showed you, is around this uh, wavelength, the maximum. If you attach to a nitro group, so an electron repulse, uh, re uh, attractive, uh, electron attractive group, you, uh, you shift the wave, the, the absorption maximum. And if you create, if you go to the next, uh, the, the final structure on the right, you can see that if you put an electron acceptor on one ether group, on one phenyl group, benzyl group, and an electron donor on the other side, you create what's called uh, in uh, organic jargon, a push-pull effect of the electrons. And this is a really in, important shift into the uh, visible. Now, it turns out that um, from the electronic point of view, if you now replace one of the uh, uh, benzyl group, phenyl group here of the azobenzene with a pyridine, you create about the same Elect, uh, change in the electronic structure of the chromophore. So, um, at this, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, many people started to, uh, I mean, it was considered what could we do with azopyridine? Because here we combine the electronic effect created by the pyridine group on the azo system. But we also introduce all the properties of pyridine. And pyridine is a really interesting molecule. Uh, it is, for example, uh, it reacts with carboxylic acids, just acids or CO2, or you can quaternize it. So it, uh, and, uh, which means that it then becomes responsive to changes in pH to the presence of CO2. It can be permanently quaternized, so it's an old new set of uh, properties. Also, uh, not to forget, it, it's an X, uh, the nitrogen of uh, pyridine is a very good hydrogen bond acceptor. So in the presence of phenol, alcohol, carboxylic acid, you form very strong hydrogen bonds. So you can create all sorts of interesting materials. It also forms halo bonds with uh, uh, halides. And for example, in this uh, case, uh, compli completely uh, substituted uh, aromatic ring. And also forms metal with metal salts particle, it forms complexes. So here we have a, a molecule which not only responds to light, but has a lot of chemical properties. This sounds interesting. So at this point, we, uh, I, we became with, with how Ren, who I think a lot, he was a PhD student in my group, in collaborations with a group in uh, in Beijing. He uh, came to my lab to study a polymer that has on one end an azopyridine and a polynipam, etc. And the idea here that we have a pH sensitive chromophore, so we'll be able to have a polymer that is pH sensitive, thermosensitive, and light sensitive. So um, this sounded very good. And uh, we started to prepare it and we studied its solution in properties, uh, solution properties at uh, neutral conditions. It forms a core shell particle with uh, in the middle, the C12 uh, group shown here that uh, was attached. Um, it forms a, a, a core and surrounded by the azopyridine and um, Interesting, and we also observed it in uh, by uh, TM, they form nice particles. So, um, 
we then measure, we then decide to study the photochemistry and see what happens when you irradiate the molecule. I would like to remind you, you may have noticed that uh, the molecule was prepared by uh, raft polymerization and we had a tritiocarbonate group. And this group actually absorbs at 310 nanometers. So in all the spectra I'm gonna show you now, we will have this band, it doesn't move, forget about it. So um, first looking at the, the, U, the UV absorbance, so this is a, a neutral condition, so the azopyridine has a band around 354, uh, at pH 10 as well, and at pH 3 it is quaternized, so it is at this position. Now, the, Strange things happened is that uh, when we irradiate at pH 10, we see that very quickly this band disappears and uh, you see that uh, you form a new band, so we go from the trans to the cis. However, here we irradiate at the same wavelength for a long time, like five minutes, nothing happens. The same goes true at pH 3. We irradiate for a minute, but we can go longer. Nothing happens. So that's where we scratched our head a little while. And uh, we finally decided, and I'll show you why in a minute, to do a, absorp a time-resolved absorption spectrum. So if I, I show you, sorry, this is the thing, sorry. Okay, sorry. Here we go. We are, we, we are, let's go to pH 10 first. We give a very short UV signal. So at the point here, we irradiate by UV and we watch the change in absorbance as a function of time. So you can, so we form the cis effect, the cis uh, compound, isomer, and we see how quickly it goes back to the transform. And you can see at pH 10, it's very slow. At pH 3, on the other hand, we irradiate it, and here the time is second. It's extremely fast. And at pH 7, it's also fast, it's a matter of second. So I uh, should stress here that the trans, the cis to trans isomerization can also occur without light. Under normal conditions for neutral pyridine, it occurs very slowly, a matter of hours. And this is what we see here at pH 10. On the other hand, under acidic condition when the azopyridine is quaternized, due to a, to a change in the uh, electronic distribution on the azopyridine ring, the cis to trans isomerization without light is extremely fast. So before you have actually finished to irradiate it just on and off, it's basically back to the trans isomer without any need of visible radiation. The same is true at pH 7, where it actually forms hydrogen bond. So at this time, by doing our um, homework very carefully, we uh, understood that uh, the, the, the the cis to trans isomerization without light changes a lot, the, the rate, its rate changes a lot as a function of the state of the azopyridine. When it's neutral unbound, it's very slow. When it's a hydrogen bound, a few minutes. When it's uh, a few seconds, and when it's uh, quaternized, milliseconds. So this is 
a summary of in the case of this polymer. So we have a thermo pH as well as light, and the light the light uh, varies in change in rate, very depending on the state of the isopyridine, a quaternized hydrogen bond, and neutral. Now, uh, further, this, this is a summary of uh, the, the spectroscopy, just for your understanding. Free isopyridine pH 7, no H bond, it's very standard. The relaxation without light is extremely slow. When it's H bound, we have a very fast return to the trans state without light. So you actually, as you measure the UV spectrum, this is the middle frame, the, the isomerization takes place. So you don't have time actually to observe it by uh, UV as spectroscopy steady state. And this is why you have the, the, the you believe that nothing happens because the UV spectrum doesn't change. But this is not the correct answer. It doesn't change because it goes too fast to observe. Now, this you can see that is a disadvantage here, but uh, we can actually do, I should, how much time do I have? Uh, oh, well, I'm still okay. 13 minutes. Okay, so um, before going to the more general picture, I would like to, uh, to tell you a little bit what we can do with the polymer we prepared with the azo group at the end and uh, the polynyl pump. We can, of course, man, this is amazing. I don't know what happened. Okay, we can. have many, many changes as a function of pH and temperature. So at pH 7, where we have hydrogen bond, you cannot touch my screen. At pH 7, where we have hydrogen bonding, shown on the right side here, we can uh, have uh, irradiate very briefly by uh, UV light and we have a, a change in the absorbance at 550 nanometers on and off, on and off, so we have very precise change in uh, absorbance. We can monitor this as a function of time. We can also of course have a cloud point and uh, so we heat from 10 to 20 degrees because of the hydrophobic substituent, the cloud point is quite low. And uh, you, uh, you can see that if we irradiate it at uh, 10 degrees, we have no change at all in the cloudiness, whereas uh, if we uh, if we if you hit it above the cloud point and irradiate it, we go from a clear a cloudy solution to a clear solution because we just cross the the cloud point line, which is uh, it depends on the isomerization state of the isopyridine. I had shown this very at the beginning. I showed you the work with uh, isobenzene, where we have a shift in the cloud point as a function of um, the cis or the trans state. So this is observed here. We, it becomes more complicated at pH 3, where it is um, quaternized. We still, we have a very fast reaction in this case, and we can, again, play around with the change in the cloudiness, with the change of the UV, this spectrum.
neutron. In uh, IPH10 is neutral and uh, not uh, hydrogen bond. The irradiation at per UV light is very stable for a long time. So, but at the same time, by changing the pH under one condition, you have a very rich way to manipulate this polymer, which is really a, a response to the complex uh, spectroscopy of pyridine. Now, finally, uh, I wanted to show you what um, can be done and has been done in the case of uh, liquid crystalline uh, materials. So this, this work was uh, published in uh, 2003 in a group of Ikeda. And um, you see that they formed uh, films out of two uh, isobenzene uh, molecules. Uh, and uh, one that had cross-linkable possibilities and others that was just uh, mono. Uh, and I, and I, a polymerizable group at one end, and uh, they formed films which actually were liquid crystalline. The film contained the azo group, and uh, if you go to um, to the to the right, you can see my uh, purple circle. You you have a, a film, and you irradiate it under UV light. You create a bending of the film because of the, the, the more constrained uh, volume occupied by the C state of the azobenzene. You irradiate it and visi with visible light and you go back to the flat sheet. And you can turn, you know, given the directionality of uh, light, you can have this, uh, the, the bending at various angles. And later on, uh, they actually made some kind of a motor that turned by, by light. You had the film rolled around this, um, the two, you follow the Greek arrow, the two uh, rotors, and uh, you radiate first on one side with the UV, on the other side with the visible, and the, the motor starts to run and you turn the wheels. So this was uh, one of the first uh, kind of mobile uh, light driven motors. But this, uh, and then I, I showed you the picture of Hai Feng Yu, who actually was a postdoc in the group of Ikeda and he became professor in, uh, in Peking University. And I, I guess I had uh, secretly looked at the life of Staudinger and I noticed that uh, he was uh, a botanist at the beginning, as we, Sergi told us. And I figured that would be an, uh, a polymer that may interest him. You see, uh, on the left side, you have uh, the leaf of um, the silk tree in China and they have a very peculiar uh, sleeping habit. In the daytime, they are the leaves open, they are brightly open at the bottom, you can see they are very open. At night, they're close together and they open again. And um, this is really related to uh, the, it's due to the very the interesting uh, morphology of the leaflet. You can see uh, at the top, it, uh, the cut through the leaf, it had a subsurface covered by some kind of a spongy tissue. And on top of it, you have a layer of photoreceptors. It's complicated photoreceptors that uh, absorbs visible light. And uh, a cut cuticle and uh, on top, and as the light absorbed, is absorbed by the photoreceptor, the, the, somehow there is a, a, an effect similar to the case of the azo 
benzene and it folds and they can fold. So this actually behavior was uh, mimicked by liquid crystalline layers and the, the, it's shown uh, on the right, the B. Uh, you can see that there is a capton at the bottom, which is the subsurface. And then we have uh, uh, layers of a polymer that contains two chromophores, the azopyridine and um, the azobenzene. And when it irradiates, you create this opening of the, of the leaves because uh, they, they are bending due to the contraction of the, uh, from the strands to the cis. And uh, so you can see this is a, a model of this. The, the pink is the actual sheet that was uh, formed. And uh, the green side on the top is um, um, which, uh, an expression of what's happening. You see that the, the sheet is flat before you start. When you irradiate it with UV, it bends on one side. You, you, you stop it, it comes back. And um, if you, instead of uh, irradiating with the UV from the, the liquid crystalline phase to that side, you go on the capton, it goes on the other side. So this is a, a way to mimic the, 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 the behavior of these uh, tea tree leaves. And so if I had to bet where we can go actually with the fast uh, responsive pyridine type of chromophore in materials, I can see that um, the 4D printing process may actually benefit from it, 4D being 3D plus time, because um, you would be able to do a very quick change in uh, shape, temporary and back, or keep it longer depending on the condition. So this is, uh, if you go back to this uh, review in advanced functional materials, uh, one of the uh, really important area for this type of uh, materials. So, I mean, there is still a lot to do with uh, ISO compounds and uh, I encourage you to, to look into it. They are very rich in chemistry and photophysics. And finally, I would like to collaborate. I mean, some of the work was done in Montreal, others in Helsinki, others in China. So it's a very, uh, broad team of group at various time. I also thank Eki Tenhu and Vladimir Aseyev now in Helsinki. And I think I still have a few minutes if I could uh, You have uh, one and a half minutes, exactly. Okay, well, I'm done. I thank you for your attention, not a word.